and a welcome to everybody. I'm looking forward, obviously, to this session very much. It's an interesting question that's being asked. Why are birds pretty? And it sounds like a very simple question, but it's a very complex one. And it's related to a lot of other questions that uh, go right along with it. So our presenter today is a young fellow and he's all the way from the University of Wa or Washington State University. And it's a nice day over there also. So we welcome Jordan Borsma. Jordan uh, got his bachelor's degree from Montana and it's been a while and he's been all over the South Pacific and following birds and <clears throat> other kinds of wildlife. An amazingly interesting life that Jordan's had for such a young fellow. He's very close to getting his PhD and he's going to tell us a little bit about his adventure and some of the birds that he's looked at. Very pretty birds. Jordan. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, so let me share my screen here. Okay, so as Gordon said, you know, this seems like a pretty straightforward question, but there are so many questions that stem from this initial question of why birds are pretty. So I just wanted to get everyone oriented here to start. So we're going to be talking about a number of things that all kind of relate to this question. Um, these first three major bullet points, um, hopefully you can see my cursor here. Um, these first three major bullet points are all just kind of background to get everyone on the same page before we start talking about the kind of research that I've been doing in Australia and New Guinea in particular. Um, and then we're going to close by talking about just briefly um, the economic and cultural significance of birds. So after we're all, um, you know, probably a little bit tired from hearing about science for, you know, a long time, um, we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about some, some broader picture things that I also um, think about. Um, so Gordon already covered some of this, but I, um, you know, just wanted to, to make it clear that I'm a, a native of, of West Michigan. Um, I graduated from Grand, Ra Grand Rapids Christian High School in 2006, and I was always intrigued by animals. Um, I really liked birds as a, as a kid looking back, but I just liked animals in general. Um, and I, you know, tended to just wanted to get as close to animals as possible. Sometimes, you know, stupidly so, um, I'd get way too close to wild animals. Um, and that sort of led me to, you know, pursuing this degree in wildlife biology at the University of Montana. So Montana offered a way for me to be closer to mountains and, and closer to some of the more like charismatic megafauna that I thought I was interested in. As it turns out, you know, as I started to work in the field, I really tunneled into birds in particular. And a lot of it, I think, is because of, you know, how, how pretty birds are and, and how many species there are everywhere that you go. It's, there's always something to look at when it comes to birds. Um, so that eventually led me to being a PhD candidate, which is what I am now at Washington State University. Um, the pandemic has thrown some hurdles in front of me um, with my lab work. So I was planning to graduate this semester and now that's looking more like, like summer or fall, um, just to make sure that I have everything completed in enough time to, to find the, the right job waiting on the other side of things. But I hope to you know, eventually be a, a professor of biology at a university and continue a lot of the research I'll be telling you about today. Um, in total, over the last decade plus, um, I've studied birds, uh, mostly in Southeast Asia. So I spent parts of four years in Malaysian Borneo, uh, parts of two years in Australia. And now I travel, you know, through Australia quite a bit because I, you know, stopped through there on my way to Papua New Guinea, which is where I've been doing my dissertation research. So I've spent parts of, of four years in Papua New Guinea um, 2015 through 17, and then again in, in 2019 for my final field season. I'm now done with all my field work. It's all lab work and, and analyses and writing that I'm that I'm doing now in Eastern Washington. And these are just some photos of me in the field in in New Guinea in particular. Um, a lot of what I'm going to tell you about today it really draws from my experiences with New, with New Guinea. Um, though I have traveled to other places, I didn't do a great job of taking photos in all those places. Um, I've gotten better these last few years, um, and New Guinea has, has been a source of so much inspiration for me, not just because of the birds, but also the, the, the people as well. Uh, but to make sure that, that everyone is kind of, you know, following along with, um, 
with what what I'm going to be telling you about my research, I, I want to make sure that we, we cover enough background to get everyone oriented. And actually, before we even get into that background, I just want to cover some terminology. And perhaps, you know, I expect that some of you probably have some interest in birds um, or in other animals and, and are somewhat aware of, of some of these terms or aware of perhaps all of these terms. But I just want to make sure we're all on the same page before we get started here. Um, so I'm going to be using all four of these terms probably quite a bit throughout the talk. So when I say plumage, I'm talking about the color, pattern, and arrangement of feathers. Molt is the process of, of producing plumage. Ornamentation is coloration that's used to signal something like competitive ability or attractiveness to conspecifics, so members of the same species. And then the phenotype is, is the set of observable characteristics of an organism. So with this example of different um, breeds of, of pigeons here, we could say that they differ in phenotypes because we have all these different um, types of the same bird. Um, they also you know, differ a bit in ornamentation because their coloration is varying and that probably is signaling something to members of their, of their species. Um, and then their plumage, of course, is, is specifically what's differing, the, the color, pattern, and arrangement of feathers. So I imagine that, that most of you are probably at least vaguely familiar with, with natural selection. Um, so you probably heard about you know, survival of the fittest. Um, the, the focus here is on survival. So if you survive, you can reproduce more and pass on more of your genes. Um, so if, if you imagine you know, a, a population of, of beetles that's varying in color and some are more brightly colored and some are, are more dull colored, um, over time, you know, predators are probably more often grabbing those more brightly colored beetles as prey. So then over time, because those more drab colored beetles are, are surviving and reproducing more, we'd expect to see more of those drab beetles in the population. Perhaps uh, eventually we're only gonna see those, those drab beetles and that green coloration is going to be lost. So there's some heritable component to this trait, you know, being coloration, and it's changing over time based on you know, differences in survival and reproduction. And this was something that you know, Darwin was, was famous for uh, publishing. And I posed this question, Darwin and Wallace, who will publish first? I think we, you know, the fact that I'm sure all of you have heard about Charles Darwin sort of answers this question. Um, perhaps some of you are familiar with Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, perhaps none of you are familiar with him. Um, certainly he's, he's known amongst biologists, but not so much outside of the biological community. Uh, but he actually came up with the same set of ideas that Darwin did um, that related to natural selection. But Darwin was a little bit older, um, came from a more privileged background, got a head start on, on Alfred Russell Wallace. And so they were exchanging these letters back and forth and discovered they had the same set of ideas. And somewhat, you know, shockingly to me, um, having worked in academia for a while where there's really big egos, uh, Wallace was, was just happy to take the back seat and let these ideas get published under Darwin's name and not you know, take any credit himself, even though these were revolutionary ideas that he also had. So history has you know, largely forgotten Alfred Russell Wallace outside of the field of biology and has remembered Charles Darwin as you know, the founder of, of these ideas. But there are actually two people who came up with the same set of ideas at the same time. Um, one just pub published them before the other. And they continued to be friends you know, for the decades that followed they would meet each other at conferences and, and they had a really um, good long lasting relationship despite the fact that you know, Wallace sort of lost out on, on some of the esteem that, that Darwin got for the same ideas. But we know that natural selection isn't really that great in explaining the, the variation in like really bright colors that we see in birds. And Darwin was, was thinking about this and he once said of, of the the peacock, the, the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze on it, makes me sick. Um, and that's because, you know, he had come up with this theory of natural selection. It did a really good job of explaining variation in a lot of things in the animal community. Um, it really helped us understand how, how animals were evolving, but it wasn't perfect. It, it didn't, you know, really help us understand why there were so many really gaudily colored or ornamented species, particularly in birds. Because clearly for a male peacock, to carry around this long train of tail feathers that are really brightly colored, he's both drawing attention from predators and also making it, you know, really hard to escape from whatever predators are in its environment. So clearly, it can't all be about survival. There has to be something else that that is, you know, driving the the evolution of these these really bright, elaborate colors. So 
that led Darwin to the, the theory of sexual selection. And here the, the focus is on competition for mates. So if you get more mating opportunities, you reproduce more and pass on more genes. So if you are an Asian paradise flycatcher, which is um, shown here in this photo, the males have this long ribbon tail. And I can attest, because I've been lucky to see this bird in, in the wild a number of times, that when they fly through the forest, they trail this, this, these long ribbon tail feathers behind them. It draws a lot of attention that they wouldn't draw in otherwise if they just had really short tails. But females prefer males with those really long tails. So over time, you know, this is the, the change that we're seeing in these flycatchers. Um, that males are adopting these really long tail feathers. And, and just to be clear here, you know, evolution is, is, is not a, a process where the males want to, you know, express this trait and then they like think about it and like exert all of their energy to do it. Um, you know, there just happened to be a mutation that, that arrived that, that, that led to these really long tail feathers. Females happen to prefer that. And this is how we see this, this trait evolve over time. So again, here the, the focus is all about just uh, maximizing your, your capacity to, to mate. And we know from over a century's worth of studies now, since Darwin initially published the theory of sexual selection, that this theory is really widely supported in birds, in male birds in particular. You know, birds are literally every color of the rainbow, and males tend to be more colorful than the females. Um, and, and the variation in male coloration really has to do with sexual selection. So it tends to be that, you know, males who are really brightly colored, females just prefer those more brightly colored or ornamented males. Um, so this theory has, has been really um, successful for explaining bright coloration um, in, in male birds. But what about female coloration? So for over a century of, of studies, again, we, we're really honing in on what's happening with males. Um, and because the males tend to be a little bit more brightly colored in mammals, they tend to be the, the individuals that have like the larger weapons that they're using. Like if you think about bighorn sheep with their long like curly Q horns, um, females also have horns, but they're not quite as long as the males. So we always focused on those really extreme cases and tunneled into the males. But if we start focusing on the females, like in the, the peafowl here, we see that the females also often have, you know, some level of ornamentation as well. And you know, until recently, there wasn't really an effort to understand what was going on with the females. So now to talk about pretty females. So we know from studies across a wide variety of organisms that females are often similarly adorned to males. So what I mean by that is similarly ornamented, um, they have similar weapons in a lot of cases and mammalian and, and insect um, taxa, but they use these competitive traits in a, in a different context. So females are, are typically using these traits to compete for non-sexual resources. So not to compete for the attention of males, but to compete with each other for access to things like food. And so when we look across organisms, we see that, that females are more often competing for these ecological resources. Again, often this is food than, than males. Males are usually keep competing for mating resources. Um, so similar kinds of traits, but, but using them in a, in a different context. And it leads us to our, our final theory here, which is the, the theory of, of social selection. So here the competition is for non-mating resources. So if you outcompete your rivals, you can survive and reproduce more. And this theory has done a really good job of explaining you know, the variation in female animals, but we're still learning a lot about females because you know, until recently, we we're sort of ignoring the females and really just studying the males. And I think one reason for this is that, you know, women were sort of excluded from sciences for a long time, um, particularly, you know, biology. There weren't many prominent female biologists until recently. And I wanted to highlight this biologist because she came up with a theory of social selection. But, you know, we're all Michiganders here. I assume, you know, if you're not from Michigan, you are now um, associated with Michigan through hope. Um, so she is a, a native Michigander. She went to um, school at University of Michigan, got all three of her degrees there in zoology. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences. And you know, it's, it's no um, coincidence to me that when there started to be prominent female biologists like Mary Jane West Eberhard, this is where we started to have a better understanding of what's going on with females. But this is still a, a constantly evolving field. There's a lot that we don't understand about females. And this is the, this, the subject of a lot of my dissertation work, which I'll talk about toward the end of, of the talk. But to summarize these, these three different theories, 
talking about coloration and birds in particular. If natural selection is the, the, the primary force that's, that's determining what kind of coloration um, a bird is adopting, then we'd expect to see really cryptic colors. So perhaps some of you didn't notice initially that in this photo on the left, there's actually two birds here. These are two frog mouths. So this is an adult frog mouth and a, a young um, nestling frog mouth that's probably getting close to fledging the nest. And this, this pile of sticks in this broken off tree is, is their nest. And so these birds you know, look almost identical to, to um, like a stump or, or a tree branch and they even adopt a posture that makes them really blend in. I've been lucky to see these birds as well. They're, they're native to Southeast Asia and, and the South Pacific and Australia. Um, so I've seen them a couple of times in the day just looking exactly like a tree, tree branch and then they notice that you're there and then, and then fly off. They do a really good job of blending in. So natural selection, you know, is gonna be the primary driving force here for the, for the coloration. They're, they're wanting to blend in so they can survive. When, when there's a lot of variation in reproductive success and it becomes all about competing for those limited mating opportunities, this is where sexual selection is, is operating. So this is where we see a lot of the most brightly colored birds in the world, particularly male birds, like in Birds of Paradise, like this male Wilson's Bird of Paradise in the bottom part of this center photo, um, this is a, a bird that is um, investing nothing in parental care. The female is left to do all of the, the care for young. So he, his whole life is about just being as pretty as possible. And when females come around to his territory, he's going to do a display to try to entice her to, to mate with him. Um, so this is the male on the bottom and the female on the top checking out this particular male. And then finally in social selection, you know, we tend to see really contrasting colors that, that tend to, to signal something. Often contrast in like yellow and black or, or white and black are used to kind of signal some, some level of competitive ability because you're competing for these non-mating resources like food. Okay, so for the final bit of background, now that we've talked about some of the, the theories here, let's talk about, you know, how exactly birds are varying in color. And so there are, are, are a variety, or there's three main types of, of coloration in birds. So there's pigment-based colors, and these can be broken into melanins, which are blacks and browns. They're endogenously produced, whereas carotenoids, they're also pigment-based. They're red, oranges, and yellows, and these are derived from the diet. So you have to be eating carotenoids and synthesizing these carotenoids um, or circulating these carotenoids to be able to produce these red, oranges, and yellows. So like this male red-winged blackbird that you know, I would expect most of you have probably um, seen at some point, they're really common, um, certainly in West Michigan and a lot of places across North America. They have exclusively pigment-based colors. So they have this black coloration um, and that is again, just endogenously produced. And then they have these, these reds and yellows on their shoulders that are derived from the diet. So these males have to find some carotenoids to, to forage on in order to produce these reds and yellows. Now there's other types of um, colors like blues and whites and everything in between that are produced by the way that they're scattering lights. So they're not actually these colors to their core. They're just reflecting, they're just reflecting that one color to produce um, what you see um, when you're looking at the bird. So I'm highlighting a, a HOPE graduate here, Tim Lehman, who some of you might be familiar with um, for his work photographing birds of paradise in New Guinea. So this is a, a blue bird of paradise and these blue feathers if you were to, to look at them closely and have them um, backlit, you'll notice that they're not actually blue um, all the way to their core. They just look gray or black. It's only when you're looking at them from, um, or when the light is being applied from above where they're reflecting that, that blue coloration. So it's kind of an illusion, the, the blue that they're producing. And then there are colors that are produced by a mix of pigment and structural plumage. And these are green. So like these, this whitehead's broadbill, which is a, a species um, native to Borneo um, has this really vibrant green color. And this is a, a layer of, of carotenoid based yellow. So diet derived yellow, and then this, this structural blue overlaid. So, you know, the mix of, of blue and yellow is what's producing that, that green coloration that we see when we look at this bird. So just to cover this in a, in a little bit more detail, Again, colors that are derived from pigments, they're that color all the way to their core. So it doesn't matter what type of light you see a male cardinal in, he's always gonna look red. 
Um, and, he, and these black feathers by his face too are always just gonna look black, no matter what light you see him in. Um, so he could fly directly overhead of you and to where he's backlit and he's still gonna look red. Um, and again, that's because you know these colors are red all the way to their core. And carotenoid based colors like red, they're derived from their diet. And this is something that zookeepers came to understand um, a long time ago when they brought flamingos into zoos. They noticed that they would turn kind of gray or brown and that's because they were no longer getting crustaceans in their diet. So normally they're in these intertidal areas where they're foraging on um, crustaceans that are really rich in carotenoids. And that's what's allowing them to produce that really um, pink color that they're known for. If you take those carotenoids out of their diet, then they just default to like a gray or brown really drab color. Um, so zookeepers discovered this and they started supplementing carotenoids to their diet so that flamingos in captivity still had this really attractive pink coloration. So structural colors, again, these are being produced um, by refracting that particular, uh, refracting the light to produce that, that color. So the, the feathers aren't actually blue all the way to their core. And so what that means is if you um, see a blue jay perched on, on a tree branch and you're looking at this and it's a brilliant blue bird and then it flies directly overhead to where it's backlit, it's just going to look gray or black like what's being shown in this far right photo here. Um, because it's not actually blue to its core. It's just reflecting that blue light when it's being applied from above. Same is true of this, this indigo bunting. It's a brilliant blue bird, but if it flew directly overhead of you, it's just gonna look gray or black because you know that blue is only being produced by just refracting light. Um, it's not actually blue all the way to the core of the feather. And this also applies to iridescent based colors. So if you've been lucky to um, you know, have close encounters with, with male hummingbirds that have these really brilliant iridescent gorgets. You maybe notice that as they're flying around, um, that the color of their gorget is changing color depending at the angle at which you're, you're viewing the bird and the angle at which the light is hitting um, that gorget. And that's because these iridescent colors are going to scatter light differently depending on the angle at which the sun is, is catching them and the angle at which you're viewing those feathers. Um, so this is another version of feathers that are not actually, you know, the color that you're perceiving um, all the way to their core. Okay, so now getting closer to the kind of stuff that I've been studying, um, hormones can, can be the, the mechanism that are driving the, the production of, of these different colors that we see in birds. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with testosterone and estrogen, and we always associate testosterone with masculine traits and estrogen with, with feminine traits. Um, and, and this is largely true for birds. Um, elevated testosterone is often what's um, being circulated right before males are, are molting in the, the, their more colorful plumage. And elevated estrogen can cause birds to, to molt in a more um, cryptic or brown plumage, which is what we often see in female birds that want to blend in because they're you know, doing most of the parental care. Um, and one thing that I think is really interesting about testosterone and, and closely related hormones is that it can mediate a variety of different traits. So there is receptors for testosterone across the, the body. Um, and each of these, these parts of the body, each of these different tissues are going to produce different effects in response to that testosterone. So in birds, testosterone can both promote ornamentation. So like in this male redback fairy run, which I'll be telling you more about um, in the next uh, topic, when I talk about the first case study, they use elevated testosterone to molt in this ornamented red and black plumage. This is the plumage that females prefer. But then testosterone can also affect the brain, so it can bind to receptors in the brain to promote the behaviors like courtship and aggression um, that, that make the, these males also more competitive. One thing I wanna highlight here, just to add some more complexity to this picture, um, is that testosterone sometimes is mediating all of these traits separately to, to produce this like broad phenotypic change to the bird, but it can also just be the first of a series of dominoes that follows. So that, you know, if testosterone is elevated, it causes this ornamentation, that causes the behaviors that are associated with ornamentations. There's like a lot of um, versions of directionality here to, to keep in mind. And this is some of the stuff that I, that I sort of tunnel into for, for my research. Um, and this photo is a little bit small, 
I'll be showing you another photo of, of my dissertation stu uh, study species doing the same thing. But this male um, in this right photo is not only puffing up those red shoulder patch feathers, or sorry, these red back feathers to the female, he's also carrying a red feather in, its, in his bill. So he's, he's carrying a, a flowers to this female. Um, so kind of much like you know, what humans do to um, try to um, attract mates, you know, he's bringing flowers to, to, his, to his mate here. Um, and this is something that, that is known across a lot of fairy wren species, which is what I've been studying for the last several years. Um, so before we, we kind of shift out of this background section um, and getting into the, the, the work that I've been doing specifically, um, I just wanted to, to pause and for about five minutes or so and, and see if there's any questions um, that you have before we move on here. Don't we have any in the chat, but feel free to unmute yourself a minute if uh, any of you have a question or comment you'd like to ask Jordan before we move on. <laughs> I think maybe that, they're all mesmerized, Jordan. That, I'm not sure. That's a, that's okay if we don't if we don't have questions. I just wanted to we to speak. pause a couple of times. Um, oh, maybe Steve does. Steve, do you have a question? No, I just wanted to say this is fascinating. So keep going. We're we're not uh, not interested. We're just kind of stunned about how great it is. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thanks. I have a question. Um, when I pick up a blue jay feather, it still is blue. So if I looked at it in the dark, would I see it other than blue? Yeah. So that's that's a good question. So what what you can do is, if you were to like hold it up to the light to where it's backlit that's where it should look just kind of gray or, or brown. So look blue from, from overhead, you know, as the light is kind of, um, the, if the light is being applied from overhead and you're looking down on it, but then if you sure. hold it up to the light, then it's gonna look gray or, or black. Okay, will do. And this is, this is something, I, I expect that there are at least some of you um, who are probably interested in, in birding or bird watching and perhaps go birding and this is, you know, when I learned about this, this was helpful for me because if you see, you know, if you're if you're not sure exactly what you're seeing, what species, and it flies overhead, you often get really deceived about the kind of colors that um, you would normally see. So it's it's good to know that these particular colors um, can look different depending on the light. Okay, well let's let's move on unless. Maybe I'll pause for like 30 more seconds, take another sip of coffee. And if no one has questions, then we can move on to the next section. All right, so let's get into um, what I've been working on. Um, and so I'm going to be telling you about a couple different fairy wren species. So just to give some background on fairy wrens, um, you probably you know haven't heard about fairy wrens unless you're like already a, a birder, um, and that's because you know they're 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 nowhere near where where we live. They're they're native to Australia and New Guinea. Uh, these are small birds that that mostly inhabit grasslands or savannas in in Australia and New Guinea. Some of the species, particularly in New Guinea, will will also go into the forest as well. Uh, but fairy wrens in part because they're inhabiting these open areas so they're really easy to study and their coloration really sticks out in their environment, have sort of emerged as model organisms for ornamentation studies. So they have contributed, studies of, of fairy wrens have contributed a lot to our understanding of why birds differ in coloration and, and why they evolve these really bright colors that again are certainly attracting a lot of attention from predators so come with a survival disadvantage. And so males of, of fairy wren species tend to be especially vibrantly colored. So I'm showing you a bunch of males here in these individual photos across multiple species. But then in this bottom left photo, this is actually a species um, native to New Guinea that inhabits forests there where the males and females are both really colorful. So the male is, is the one that's all blue and black. Female is blue and black, but also has some brown coloration um, and has this sort of like purple tinge to these brown feathers that is just um, really, uh, you know, I didn't fully anticipate this until we actually, you know, caught this bird 
um, just how unbelievably beautiful it was in the hand. Um, and so females will, will also vary a lot in coloration, but again, until recently, we're really just zeroing in on, on these males and trying to understand them. But there's a lot to be learned about, about females and fairy wrens. And one of the reasons that fairy wrens have sort of emerged as model organisms for these studies, they're, they're pretty extreme in a lot of ways. So one thing we've learned in part from studying fairy wrens is that social monogamy in birds does not mean sexual monogamy. So you, you may have heard before that birds like bald eagles will uh, mate for, for life. So that males and females have a really stable pair bond. They stay together for the duration of their lives. Um, and that is, that is true across really a lot of birds. Um, they often maintain really long-term partnerships with their mate. But that doesn't mean that they aren't mating with, with other individuals. They might have you know, a, a territory that they defend with their mate, but they're also kind of going around and, and seeking copulations with other members of, of their species. And this is not only are the males flying around and you know, seeking matings with, with other females outside of their social mate, but the females often do this as well. Um, this has been discovered in, in fairy wrens in particular. Um, and, and, and so, you know, this is, this is how we end up with a lot of variation in reproductive success. And this is how we end up with um, really high sexual selection pressure. So when there's a lot of variation in reproductive success, this is where we end up a lot of times with really bright coloration. Um, because if you are really drab as a male, you might not get any mating opportunities at all. If you're really brightly colored, you might be able to mate with a lot of different females. And so you're, you know, spreading those genes um, to, to as many um, individuals as possible. Um, and that is ultimately the goal for, for these males. So I'll be showing you some birds uh, or so, some results from um, catching birds and, and sampling hormone levels. And the way that we do this is we use mist nets. So this is a, a photo of, of me with um, one of my local field assistants in New Guinea, Morrison. So I'm about to tell you about an Australian species. I just want to make this clear, but this is a photo taken from New Guinea um, in 2019. And this is the net that we use to, to catch birds. So we'll go out and, and find the birds that we're looking for, set up these nets and then use radios um, to, to kind of coordinate flushing these birds into the net. And though this net is really obvious from this angle, especially with the wind blowing it the way that it is, if you are directly facing the net, it's, it can be really hard to see. So these are called mist nets. Um, because it, it does just kind of look like mist or maybe like some spider webbing in front of you. So birds will see this and think that they can just kind of fly through it. And when they hit the net, they'll drop into each of these individual um, pockets of, of the net. So it's a way to, to safely catch them. And then of course, you have to be really careful taking them out, especially really small birds because they can get injured if they're tangled in the net in a particular way. And so it takes a lot of training to you know, ensure the, the safety of the birds but it is a very reliable way to, to safely um, catch them. And so this is, this is how we're, we're doing the, the studies that I'm about to tell you about, um, is we're able to catch these birds and, and study them long-term. And one thing that's really great about using mist nets to, to catch birds and doing this kind of research is that you might be looking for one particular bird um, but while you're flushing that bird in the net, you might flush a, a wide variety of other really amazing birds in the net. So these are all photos, again, that are taken from New Guinea. Um, but a lot of these species, actually most of these species, are also in Australia as well. They share a lot of the same types of birds. New Guinea, you know, just has some, some, some more birds of paradise and some of the more extravagant um, birds in addition to like the common birds that are in Australia. And so these are all birds that I've taken in, in my hand um, that I've just kind of caught by accident while I'm trying to catch um, the species that I'm after. Um, I want to highlight this photo in the bottom right. This is my friend Doka, who I'll be telling you about a little bit more later, um, and field assistant in New Guinea. He's traveled across New Guinea with me. Um, he did travel to Australia as well and, and helped with some of the projects that I'm about to tell you about with these redback fairy wrens in Australia. Um, but here he is with a parrot, which is the most surprising um, bycatch that we ever had. Normally these, these parrots, this is actually a scaly breasted lorikeet, um, a small type of parrot, are flying way overhead. Um, and for whatever reason, this individual dropped down low enough that it hit, it hit our net. I didn't actually see it hit the net. I walked up to the net to check to see if anything was in there and was shocked to see this thing. I was so excited to hold this parrot because I've never caught one before that you know, I quickly you know, 
safely extracted it from the net and it drew blood almost immediately because they have these really, you know, like hooked bills, kind of like a falcon and they just rip into your fingers. So this is Doka sort of giving it a dirty look because the same thing happened to him. He came up with this way to kind of safely handle them using the bag that we store our mist nets in. Um, so this is just one of the advantages of doing this, this type of research. You have unexpected close encounters with some really amazing birds. But getting back to the research, now, now we're back to, to talking about this Australian species, the red-backed fairy wren. So what makes this species interesting is that most first-year males and all females look like this. They're kind of cryptic, brown and white. So males can actually breed looking like this and the males and females are pretty much indistinguishable. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that we will catch them and put these color bands on them. So you can probably see um, some bracelets on this bird and each, each bird in, in a study population is gonna have a different combination of colors so that when you look at them with your binoculars, you can you know, write that sequence of colors and identify that individual. So we can tell apart males and females and, and young from males and females and track these family groups of, of these birds over time. Um, so males in their first year, for the most part, they look like this. But then after their first year and some of those first year males, will elevate testosterone in circulation and that will facilitate this transition to becoming black and red. Um, so having this really contrasting plumage and this is the, the plumage that's preferred by females. So if you're able to produce this, this red and black plumage then you're gonna have much higher reproductive, reproductive success than if you remain brown. Again, if you have this red and black plumage, that might be a, a, attracting unwanted attention from predators in addition to the attention you want from females. Um, so there are trade-offs here, but if you're able to you know, elevate testosterone enough, you're able to arrive at this um, phenotype, this red-black phenotype that, that in, increases reproductive success. And it's just being accomplished really by this, this subtle change in testosterone. Um, so one thing that we set out to, to determine is, is how, how testosterone specifically is affecting this. And so I'm going to get molecular just for a little bit. Um, we, we won't stay here for that long, but this is probably like the, the most, um, I guess, complicated thing that, that we're going to talk about um, is how exactly testosterone is, is affecting these different types of, of males. So during the pre-breeding season, there are cues in the environment, like social cues, like how many females are around, whether or not you're gonna be able to find a mating opportunity for the breeding season. Um, you know, perhaps the amount of water or rain that's, that's falling, that's affecting, you know, how much prey is available. Um, and then there are intrinsic cues like condition and age. Um, so how much, like how many fat stores you have um, to, to be able to like produce the energy that you need to, to elevate testosterone. And then if, if you're able to produce high testosterone, then that leads to higher expression of this one gene in the liver. So it's just changing mostly this one gene in the liver and this gene in the liver controls your ability to take the carotenoids in your diet and, and circulate those to your feathers. So again, I told you before that red coloration is diet derived um, like the, the pink and flamingos. So these birds are, are eating insects that are rich in carotenoids, but only through elevating testosterone can they affect their organs to, to circulate um, these carotenoids into their feathers to produce this red coloration. And once they have these red back feathers, this is where they end up having higher reproductive success. So if they're not able to elevate testosterone, then they have lower expression of this gene in the liver. They end up with these low circulating carotenoids. They can't produce that red coloration. So that means that they're going to have really low reproductive success. So again, just these, these slight changes in one hormone have these major effects on the um, breeding success of this species. And so the study that, that brought me to, to graduate school was very much unplanned. So I was running an experiment for a graduate student um, who was trying to understand how social cues affect the, the kind of ornamentation that a male produces. So whether he you know, remains unornamented or produces that ornamented red and black plumage. And so this is what, in, in the top left, what the habitat normally looks like. There's tall grass that the birds nest in. They spend most of their time foraging in, in that grass as well. 
But right in the middle of this experiment, so about two and a half months into this social experiment, uh, a fire came through um, and destroyed all of the grass. Um, and this left the, the habitat, all that grass completely charred. And the birds stuck around because this is not a migratory species. They always stay in the same area long term. And so these, these poor birds were sort of stuck trying to, to forage in the top of these eucalyptus trees, which is not normally where they spend their time. Um, and, and it completely spoiled our experiment. We sort of realized that, you know, from the ashes of this fire that we could start to understand how environmental disturbances like fire, which are increasing over time, um, particularly as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, um, in California, you know, there's, there's more and more wildfires um, over the last several decades. This is also true in Australia. They just had one of their worst fire seasons on record um, in 2020. And so it's important to understand how animals are responding to these fires. Um, and so that's what we set out to do. Um, and one um, sort of unfortunate but kind of funny thing that happened is we you know, had this site that burned and we were starting to catch the birds there and assess their, their physiology and their ornamentation. And then you know, halfway through that study, um, the site that we were using as a control that hadn't burned uh, started to burn. So we went there to, to start catching birds and then we saw that there was a fire there. So here I am in the bottom right photo, um, sort of angrily uh, gesticulating at this fire that was destroying our control site. Um, so this is just to highlight the unpredictable nature of doing these kinds of studies in, in the wild. Um, things like fires happen um, and you just kind of have to scramble to, to find a way to, to deal with it. So we ended up using that as another site where, where fire was happening so that we could better understand, you know, how these fires are affecting the birds. And one thing that, that I noticed while I was sampling these birds is that um, relative to a normal year where again the grass looks like this and there's a lot of opportunities to breed in this grass. If you walk around and you're looking at all the pairs of fairy wrens defending their territories, you'll see males that are mostly, you know, that ornamented red and black. Um, females are always brown and white. But then you see, you know, occasionally a pair where the, where the male remained brown and white for the breeding season. Um, but during this year where there is a fire occurring, um, I was noticing that there really weren't many birds that were producing that, that red and black ornamented coloration. It was a lot of males who were, who were remaining really drab and brown, which is again the, the, the type of male that the females don't prefer. They, they prefer to be with the males that are, that are prettier. And so we wanted to quantify this. And so what I'm showing you here are some results from this study that's, that's in review currently. Um, and I compared the, the year where there was a fire that happened to a year where it was normal monsoon conditions. So normally the rain will, will come and then these birds will, will molt into their ornamented coloration and start breeding. Um, but these birds during the fire year, they were very different in ornamentation. They were much less ornamented than during that wet year. They're also a lot less ornamented during a year where it was really dry and there wasn't a lot of breeding because it was a drought, but there was no fire. So fire does appear to represent a pretty major disturbance to the, the breeding of this, this species, which you know isn't a huge surprise considering that it's at least temporarily destroying the grass that they can breed in. So these males are responding to that by, by kind of staying drab and brown, probably so that they can blend into their environment better, not attract unwanted attention from predators when females aren't looking to breed anyway. So what is causing this suppressed coloration? Again, it appears to be at least somewhat related to testosterone, those males that were able during the fire year to produce the ornamented red and black coloration, they had slightly higher testosterone than those males that were staying brown or unornamented. Um, so testosterone is probably part of this picture. But it's also possible these birds were, were stressed by the conditions. And one of the ways that wildlife researchers assess stress in wild animals is to measure um, stress hormones like corticosterone or cortisol. So cortisol is the mammalian, so human um, equivalent to corticosterone. Birds use corticosterone instead of cortisol, but it's the same type of hormone. So this is a hormone that's often associated with stress. So as you're stressed, your, your cortisol or corticosterone levels rise. And we do find a, a slightly um, um, significant difference here where after the fire, these birds were, were elevating the stress hormone relative to before the fire. So perhaps this is interfering with their ability to, to breed and produce these really vibrant colors. 
And so to conclude this, this section here, again, testosterone is, is really important for these males to be able to transition to being brown, to being red and black, which is what the females prefer. But fire appears to, to interfere with that, you know, keeping those testosterone re levels pretty low and, and keeping those males from adopting that um, phenotype, that ornamented coloration that the, that the females prefer during the breeding season. Okay, I have another pause here for questions. But again, we can, we can advance if, um, if there aren't any questions yet, but I'll just pause for a little bit. How do you check testosterone in such a tiny bird? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so we take a blood sample um, and spin that blood sample in a centrifuge to separate the plasma from the red blood cells because the hormones are in the plasma. Um, and then we uh, store that that plasma in in the freezer, and then bring that back. and And I do it in our our lab here, um, measure the testosterone. So we actually have to take the the part that's really difficult about this, um, besides the lab work that has to be done, is getting a large enough blood sample from such a small bird. So we actually have to go into the the jugular vein. Um, which is perfectly safe um, for birds. Like we haven't had any problems with it, but it takes a lot of um, experience to learn how to do that safely because you are, you know, holding a really tiny bird and like stretching its neck a little bit to get that that blood sample um, and make sure that you're not taking too much blood. So we use these these tiny insulin syringes where we can control exactly how much blood we're taking so that we're not taking so much to really disturb them. Um, so this was a, a technique I, I learned several years ago and continue to, to, to use today because um, these birds, yeah, are like about eight to 10 grams. So, you know, they're smaller than, they're, they're just a little bit bigger than I guess a, a hummingbird. Um, so really tiny birds. Another question, Jordan, is can you speak to the seasonal changes in coloration, for example, in goldfinches? Yeah. So that is going to be kind of similar to these redback fairy wrens. So a lot of birds will will transition from being drab during the non-breeding season because there's no incentive to be colorful when you don't need to attract attention from, from females to becoming um, more colorful during the breeding season. And a lot of times, again, it's, it's high testosterone during those periods that's um, causing these molecular changes in the birds to produce that coloration. I don't know if goldfinches in particular are using testosterone to adopt that more colorful plumage, um, but it's probably it's probably uh, hormone driven when it's a, a seasonal change like that. Another question. I was wondering if uh, the the preference by the female of the male that is brightly colored was also a defense mechanism. The more colorful the male, the more secure the female feels because the more the male is likely to attract the predators. Yeah, no, that's that's a let me let me think about that. So so you're thinking that that drawing attention, the female then would know, okay, that the attention is being drawn to the to the male and not to me. Right. And the more colorful, the more likely. Yeah, I, th I think that could that could be possible. I think that the only thing is, you know, they do they do tend to maintain those pair bonds year round. So we at least we assume we don't know, of course, what's everything that's happening in the brain of these tiny birds, but we assume that they they do value their mate to some degree. So you know, they're not going to want their mate to draw too much attention from predators. And and another thing is that. In, at least in these fairy wren species, the males will still help feed the nestlings. So they'll visit the nest with those really right. bright colors. So it, it is, um, yeah, so the, the female will still be suffering some disadvantage because the male is gonna be visiting the nest where she might be with those sure. bright colors. Um, okay. But yeah, that's, that's, that's a good thought. Um, I'd have to think about that more. Okay, thank you.
One more, um, just the, well, actually two more. What is the lifespan of the fairy wren? And then a second question is, does the coloration of the male revert to pre-mating color till the next mating season? Yeah, um, so the, they, they live, we don't know precisely their lifespan and that's true of most birds because it, you know, it takes so much effort to track them really long-term. Um, what I can say from working with this, with this particular species is we had some individuals that made it to eight or nine years old, which is pretty long lived for such a small bird. Um, and perhaps, you know, that, that's sort of like a, it, it's an estimate and perhaps they're even older than that. Um, but most of them will, we presume die off because they disappear um, after like four or five years. Uh, but there are, you know, birds like the Laysan albatross, perhaps some of you have, have seen in the news, this um, female named Wisdom of the Laysan albatross who's nesting in Hawaii. And she is, I think it's 70 years old now and still, um, still laying eggs, which is, which is absolutely wild. Um, so certainly these birds aren't living that long, uh, but they're living pretty long for a young bird. And, and the, the question about remaining colorful, that is actually something that um, I have collaborators who have been working on because we don't really fully understand exactly what is happening with some of these males. So some, some of the, the older males will actually stay red and black throughout the year. Most of them will, will revert back to being brown when they're not breeding, um, but some of them stay red and black. And what, what we don't know is if those males are, you know, why, why they would stay red and black because at least to me, you know, you'd expect them to transition back to being brown when they're not breeding because they're otherwise attracting unwanted attention from, from predators by remaining really colorful. Um, but it, there's also some studies that show, you know, in some farrier and species that these really colorful males are the best at sort of assessing predator threats in their environment. So the more colorful they are, the better they are at kind of like looking around and assessing um, what could be presenting danger. Um, so they're, they're more aware when they're, when they're looking really colorful. Um, so perhaps then they're able to, you know, survive with this really gaudy coloration. What are some of the predators? Yeah, um, predators, I think they're mostly, they're mostly like hawks um, that, are, that are preying on these birds. Um, I imagine in, in rare cases, snakes. Um, there are certainly a lot of snakes in Australia and New Guinea. And, and a lot of very venomous snakes. Um, and definitely doing field work with these species, you know, as you walk around, you're often getting pretty close to stepping on snakes that may or may not be very venomous. Um, so I would imagine because they're spending so much time in the grass that, that there are snakes preying on them. But this is another thing that's just so hard to study because how do you, you know, how do you see these rare predation events happening unless you have like cameras everywhere to kind of track what's happening. Um, but certainly there are, there are birds that hunt them. We've actually had the, the most mortality that I've experienced. So occasionally with this redback fairy wren species, while you're catching them, you have to be really careful to immediately take them out of the net because kookaburras are really smart and they will perch right next to the net knowing that that's designed to catch birds. And we've had kookaburras dive into the net and, and kill fairy wrens in the net before. Um, I don't know if they're, they're, they're able to like move swiftly enough to, to catch them if they're not caught in a net, but perhaps kookaburras are also contributing um, to, to the predation of these birds. Okay, so unless there are other questions, I'll move on to the next section, which is what I've been working on for my dissertation. Uh, so we just went through a male case study, the redback fairy wren. You know, we were talking about things in the context of sexual selection, so competing for mates. Now we're talking about variation in female coloration. And again, here, we think that this is more about competition for non-mating resources, but we're still learning, you know, how females end up varying in coloration. So with that in mind, 
uh, I've been part of a collaborative group studying this species in Papua New Guinea. It's a species that is endemic, so it only lives on the island of New Guinea, which um, is both, there's an Indonesian side, West Papua, um, which I'm highlighting here with my cursor. You can just see part of it here. Um, and then the rest of the, uh, the island is, is the country of Papua New Guinea, which separated from Australia about 48 or 49 years ago. Um, and so we've been studying two subspecies of this bird. And what I imagine some of you are thinking here um, as you're looking at photos of this bird is, we were just talking about these really brightly colored birds and now I'm showing you a black and white species. Um, one thing I wanna make clear is that in a lot of birds, black and white is used to, to signal something. Um, so, you know, you can't get more contrast than black and white. And as these birds are flying around grasslands, these black and white individuals really stand out, particularly those white shoulder patches against the, the black background. Um, and so we've been studying this species because within a single species, females are varying in ornamentation. So males are always black and white. So they're always ornamented, but females can be cryptic, um, kind of like those female red-backed fairy wrens I was showing you where they're brown and white, or they can be black and white like the males. So they have this really contrasting plumage um, that really draws the eye in. So we've been studying one subspecies in the Western part of the country of Papua New Guinea here, and that has these unornamented females, and then one um, subspecies over here in the Eastern part of the country in this coastal province called Milne Bay province where males and females are both black and white. So when I talk about ornamented versus unornamented, I'm talking about the different types of females. Um, again, variation in coloration is common across female species and is something we don't fully understand, but it's rare in one single species to have variation in female color. It's usually males that are varying. So this gives us a really good opportunity to, to try to understand what exactly is happening with these females, why they've um, gone from being really cryptic in some areas to being um, more ornamented in, in, in other parts of, of their range. And so I just wanted to highlight a couple of things before we, we get back into the science here. Um, I am tremendously lucky to work in such a beautiful place. Uh, Papua New Guinea has really uh, captured my heart in a lot of ways, um, in part because it's just such a beautiful tropical paradise. Um, so I've been lucky to work, you know, in a lot of tropical environments. New Guinea is just different. It's the most, uh, I've had the most crazy adventures of anywhere I've worked in, in New Guinea. There's just constantly something to, to be discovered there. Um, it's called the land of, of the unexpected by a lot of people, including, you know, Papua New Guineans. And it really is a, a motto that I found to be pretty true. Like there's just constantly unexpected things that you're discovering there. Um, so in this top left photo, this is an example of you know, one of the villages we work in. This is kind of an extreme example. So we're, we're always living in, in, a, in a relatively small village because the, the birds that we're studying live in open habitats and villages tend to be in these open habitats. And they're, you know, they're not very sensitive to humans. They let you get pretty close. They're not very shy. Um, so living in villages gives us access to you know, some resources that help us just you know, live um, while, while having access to the birds that we're studying. But this, this village here um, that we worked in in 2019 is one that we had to hike several miles to get to um, with all of our gear. Um, and, and then we spent um, a long time there completely off the grid, like no, no cell phone service, no running water or electricity. None of our, our field sites have running water or electricity, but some of them have cell phone service. This one is different in that we had to you know, walk a long distance to get to it. And then you're just really secluded in this remote area. And it was, uh, it, this is exactly the kind of stuff that I really love to do is just to get um, way out in nature. There's only about 40 people who live in this village. So you can kind of get to know everyone um, and become like part of the family while you're there. Um, the hospitality in New Guinea is beyond anything I've experienced in, in any of my travels, um, which is a huge part of why I want to keep going back. Um, and oh, and just in case this wasn't clear, um, this is a, a mist net that's being set up here. Um, so it's a, the, this is being tweaked to, to make sure that the, the net is, is ready to catch birds. This was at the beginning of, of our field season in 2019. In this top center photo, this is me learning to climb a coconut tree. I did this a couple of times. It was uh, frankly, like pretty terrifying. Um, I really like rock climbing, but the thing about rock climbing is, you know, 
it can be scary, but you use a rope. So you have some protection uh, with climbing a coconut tree. It's a little bit more um, harrowing because yeah, you don't really have any sort of safety net. Um, so climbing coconut trees is a big part of the culture in, in some of these areas, particularly coastal areas where there's a lot of coconuts. Uh, coconuts are worked into every single meal. And so I want to learn, you know, the, the entire process from climbing a coconut tree to husking the coconut to scraping out the insides to um, use for, for cooking. So this was me learning how to climb a coconut tree, which I did somewhat successfully. I did um, have a hard time coming down. Going up was fine, but coming down, I just sort of slid down and just scraped um, a lot of the skin <laughs> off my, my chest and belly. So it was a painful experience, um, which is why I've only done it a couple of times. Um, in the, the far right photo here, this is a photo I took in 2019 uh, during an expedition that we did to a, a really remote area um, that hadn't been explored before, including by, by local people. So this river had been explored before. We went up to some montane areas um, that the locals hadn't been to before to look for some new bird species. And this is, um, it's hard to see, I imagine, on, on your monitors, but there are two individuals here um, one, again, is, is Doka, um, who I've already told you about, who's sitting, and Jason, who is my American field assistant in 2019. Um, and just to give you a reference for how massive this waterfall was, this is just a narrow chute that we discovered before the, the massive waterfall that dropped off. So I'm looking back at them from where the actual waterfall was. This to us just looked like a small chute at the time in comparison to this waterfall. And we had no idea that it was there. Um, so this was a totally unexpected discovery. We were walking down this, this river, um, chasing after this one particular bird um, that was of interest to us. And it just dropped down this, this water chute and then dropped off this massive cliff. And we reali re realized like, okay, this is where our exploration ends. Um, so I hiked down you know, safely to the, um, where the waterfall dropped off. And it was probably about 150 feet. And I'm, I know it, of course, the, the local people in these areas are aware of this waterfall. There's no trails going to the base of it. There's probably very few people who have actually like fully taken in this waterfall, certainly no tourists or Westerners in the past. Um, and this is just to highlight, you know, the, the unexpected um, beauty that you just come across in New Guinea. There's just, there's so much ground to, to explore there. In this bottom center photo, this is an example of, you know, what our field sites can look like. So I haven't been to Hawaii, but of course I've seen photos of Hawaii. I think it, it looks a lot like, um, areas of Hawaii that, you know, have these forested and grassy mountains, um, just really luxuriant green um, foliage everywhere. It's, it's truly a, a tropical paradise. And in the bottom left, this is a, a photo I took snorkeling. Um, during, during the afternoon, we, we tend to take off from studying birds because the, the birds sort of retire for a little bit because it's so um, swelteringly hot during the middle of the day because we're really close to the equator. And so this is, um, you know, just an example of the amazing marine life to see there. It's, if you talk to like experienced divers, um, it is one of the best, if, if not the best area in the world to, to see marine life. The, the quality of the coral there is, is unmatched because there's not many tankers that go over it, unlike the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. So that the health of the coral is much better um, and the marine life is, is unbelievable. And I'm, I'm telling you about my, my research in the next several slides. I, I mostly use we because I'm, I'm talking about this, this big team of, of people that have made this research possible, most of which are, are, are local Papua New Guinean people. Um, so I want to highlight them here before we, we get back into the science. Um, so I've already told you a little bit about Doka, who's in this top right photo. Um, this is a um, photo we took. Uh, at sort of a, a mini Yellowstone at the end of our, our expedition. So we're on this island that had really um, high geothermal activity um, akin to Yellowstone, not quite as extreme as Yellowstone, um, but there were geysers and, and like prismatic pools and you just walk right up to them. You have to of course follow your local guide who's a native to the area and knows where you can step safely and where you cannot um, because people um, who have gone there and not respected their local guides have plunged through and um, you know, had some very unfortunate experiences with boiling mud. Um, so, you know, unlike Yellowstone, there's no trails or boardwalks. Um, so you have to be really careful when you're walking around these areas. Um, but really amazing to just get up close and, and personal with some of these geysers and, and pools and separated from 
you know, like the, the crowds of tourists that descend upon Yellowstone. I expect that this is an area that will in the future really be explored by um, more and more people. It's gonna attract more and more tourists. Um, in this uh, top center photo is, is Serena who has made everything I'm gonna tell you about possible. We, we couldn't have done it without her. So she was our first point of contact in New Guinea. She is widely respected across um, the province that, that she's from. Um, and has some experience in the past working with a, a conservation organization. Um, so she's already familiar with, with field research to some degree. She's really good in the field and, and better than anyone I've ever met at just managing the logistics of, um, of dealing with landowner issues and um, just making sure everyone is, is happy all the time and, and looking after everyone on our project. Um, so here she is in this top center photo with a, a young bandicoot that this boy in the green shirt had, had caught. I'm not sure how he caught this, um, but the kids are, are very skilled there in catching animals. And so this is a, a bandicoot that will be raised until it's old enough to be um, eaten for a, a good meal of, of protein. Um, in the top left is uh, an example of, you know, what it's like to do research in some of these areas. So um, we will often be out and catching birds and we want to keep our equipment dry and it you know, rains a lot in the tropics. So if the rain comes, um, we often seek shelter underneath people's houses um, if they're willing to, you know, let us uh, camp there for a little bit. So I'm holding um, my study species here. I know it's really hard to see. I'm circling it with the, the cursor just to give you a sense of how tiny these birds are. That's the bird in my right hand. Doka and Serena are, are recording um, data for me there. In the bottom left, this is John, um, who it was our captain. Um, uh, as we took these open boat rides across like pretty deadly seas um, where, where boats will, will capsize. So you need a really experienced captain who you can trust. Um, we entrusted him with our lives and he never let us down. Um, there's also a lot of piracy in some of these areas. Um, and he was really good at just making you know, those journeys as, as safe as possible. He's also really good in the field. Um, so uh, really is keyed into the, the birds in his area like a lot of local people are. Um, and is you know really good at, at chasing birds into nets. He's posing here with two spears, two traditional spears from his area. Um, this is from the area that I showed you the photo of on the last slide, the field site that's pretty remote. So these spears were used back in cannibalism times by his um, ancestors. Um, and they would, they would tip these spears with, or they put um, toxins derived from plants on the tip of these spears to make them especially lethal. Um, and then, you know, these rival tribes would um, have these ceremonial battles and, and this is how they would end up with um, human meat to consume. So, you know, there is a dubious history with cannibalism in, in New Guinea. Um, I learned a lot about it my final year in 2019, talking with some of the, the elders there. They are, of course, no longer doing this. Um, it's, a, it's a thing of the past, fortunately. Um, in the next bottom photo here, um, this tall white guy is, is Eric. So he was a, a graduate student who helped train me in New Guinea my, my first year and we continue to work together now. He is now a, a postdoc in, in Sweden. Um, and he's become a, a good friend and a really good collaborator. Um, he is next to Kipling, who's one of our local field assistants in Western province. So the province that's really close to the Indonesian side of the country. And Kipling has been our boat captain as we travel down the river, which is a lot safer. Um, not many concerns about safety there, but is a long like 12 to 18 hour boat ride that we take to our field site. Um, so he's been a really good boat captain, but also has helped us in the field, is really good with birds, is a really accomplished hunter. So here's a bow and arrow that he made out of bamboo. Eric has just fired an arrow and um, Kipling is kind of giving him a judgmental look for being so awful um, with a bow and arrow. Um, and then next to the right is Morrison with a young cassowary chick. We'll talk about cassowaries a little bit at the end. Um, but Morrison has, has been a really um, solid field assistant and is part of the, the family that has granted us access to, the, to their land. Um, so land is, is almost exclusively privately owned in New Guinea. It's owned by, by tribes and clans. And so doing research there requires, you know, some pretty complex negotiations with the local landowner groups. And so it's really important to have local people who are well-respected like Morrison and, and Serena, who can help with those negotiations and can you know, communicate clearly that we are students who are coming there with limited money. We're going to do the best we can to train people and provide benefits in the form of um, some level of employment while we're there, but we're not there to just, you know, 
drop a bunch of cash in people's laps like the, the resource extraction companies that um, people are, are familiar with in New Guinea. Um, so this is a, a constant battle that we kind of have to have to wage there to, to keep our research going. And it, it isn't possible without people like Serena and Morrison. And the bottom right is, is uh, just a family of, of people um, who are part of the family that gave us access to their land in, in Western province. And we became friends with, they kind of adopted us during our time there. So I'm, I'm very grateful to them. Okay, so getting, getting back to the science now. Again, what's interesting about the species to us is that the females are varying in ornamentation by subspecies. And just to give you a sense of what the habitat looks like, these are satellite images of our sites. So in the top left, this is where the unornamented females are. And I'm showing you these social network plots where males are in blue, individual males, and individual females are in pink. And these lines show that, there is, that they're interacting. These individuals are interacting at some point. And the darker the line, the more they're interacting. Um, so you can see in this unornamented subspecies, the habitat is really continuous. So the habitat is the, the open grassland. There's so much open grassland to inhabit here. And I think because of that, these birds are you know, really interacting a lot. They're constantly bumping into each other in their environment because they don't have like environmental barriers in, in the form of forest patches that they're coming across. And so there's a lot of sociality in this unornamented subspecies. We don't see that so much in this ornamented female subspecies. Here we just see males and females on their territories. Um, not a lot of interaction outside of those pair bonds. So it's mostly just males and females defending their territories and making sure they don't lose those limited, the limited access to, to grass patches. Um, in the bottom left is um, something that I showed you before with redback fairy wren. So here is a male white shoulder fairy wren who's carrying a red flower petal to a female. You can again see these colored bracelets that we give the, the birds to tell apart the individuals. Um, so he is, he is trying to entice this female to mate with him either now or later um, by bringing this flower petal. Um, and often they'll also bring um, food to, to, to give to females to, to entice them to mate. Um, and so this is what's really driving these differences in, in how much they're socializing. In these areas where the females are less um, ornamented, we see males constantly flying around with flower petals and food, and they all kind of come together and watch these displays of the males happen. Um, and then this is used to kind of determine like who to mate with and who not to mate with. So I'll be coming back to these images later when I you know, try to put all these results into context. But getting back to testosterone, because that is ultimately what I um, became interested in, in in graduate school, is trying to understand how testosterone is affecting all of these traits like ornamentation and these behaviors like courtship and aggression, um, all these traits together to, to form the, these complex phenotypes. I wanted to understand if, if females in this species that, that are varying in phenotypes are using testosterone the same way males are. So though we always associate testosterone with being more masculine, females also circulate testosterone and perhaps they're using the same hormone to do the same kind of things that males usually do. Um, but this is something that we don't really have an understanding of at all um, because we haven't studied females until very recently. And so we set out to determine this and I wanna just quickly show you one last sort of methods-based thing here, um, cause I'm gonna be showing you some results about territoriality. And the way this is accomplished in birds typically is you place um, mounts of the birds. So, like, so here are two cardstock mounts. Um, and what you can't hear is that I'm playing the, the song of the species. It brings in the, the territorial pair. So each you know, area has a, has a, 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 a territorial pair. Um, that belongs to that area. And they will come in and then respond to that song and those decoys. And the more, you know, the, the closer they get and the more they sing, um, they're often singing together, so duetting, the more they do these behaviors, the, the more territorial they are. And so this is what these, these behavioral trials look like. Okay, so we first set out to understand if ornamented females have higher testosterone and are more territorial, kind of consistent with what we normally see in, in males who are more ornamented. And we did actually find that, that ornamented females had higher testosterone than unornamented females. They were also more territorial than ornamented females. So they seem to be more competitive. Um, and so I wanted to understand if testosterone was 
the responsible for these differences. If it was simply that there are changes in, in how much testosterone these different types of females were circulating, and that was producing these major effects that we see on their ornamentation and behavior. So again, we're starting from these differences in ornamentation and territoriality, the ornamented females being more territorial. So I gave these unornamented females elevated testosterone. So I, I use these tiny beeswax and peanut oil implants that are inserted under the skin. And these elevate testosterone for about two to three weeks. And what I wanted to first determine is, you know, right during that period where, where testosterone is really elevated, are they defending their territory, territories more aggressively consistent with what the ornamented subspecies does? And the answer here was no. So they, by giving them testosterone, this didn't initially affect how territorial they were. So it doesn't seem like testosterone is the reason that those ornamented females are more territorial. However, one thing that we discovered that was really interesting is after we gave these females elevated testosterone, after a couple of weeks, we started to notice that they had these, these white shoulder patches. And again, these are the unornamented females where normally they're not producing any level of ornamentation. They don't have these shoulder patches. They're just, they're just brown and then have this like white throat. So by just manipulating how much testosterone they had, we produced this completely like new type of female. Um, so they molted in these white shoulder patches. And interestingly, once they had those white shoulder patches, they were then more territorial or more aggressive in defending their territories. So it made them more competitive. And so what we sort of are starting to think is that, you know, these in, in females, these shoulder patches are functioning in the context of competing for these limited territories. Um, so this is consistent with that theory of social selection that I told you about earlier that was put forth by um, that Michigander, uh, Mary Jane West Eberhard. Um, so our results are kind of fitting with that, with that theory with females. They're using these, these traits that males often have, but to compete instead for, or instead of for matings for, for competing um, for, for territories in particular. Okay, so what does this all likely mean? So I think what this all likely means is that the, the ornament in females enhances, enhances competitiveness where it is needed. So if you're in a habitat, like what these ornamented females um, are found in, where there's very limited grassy areas, where you have to really compete for, for access to those limited territories, you need to develop traits um, or you're incentivized to develop traits that are going to help compete for those limited territories. So females are competing with each other here for access to those territories where there's the best food and the best ability to, to, to make a nest in, in the grassland. Whereas over here in this, this more open continuous habitat where we see the unornamented females, there's not really a reason to compete so much if you're a female for access to these territories because there's territories everywhere. Um, so there's no need to you know, develop a, a, a shoulder patch that uh, perhaps might draw some more attention to you um, when you don't really have to compete so much for territories. And I kind of already addressed this a little bit, I hinted at this, but, but why don't all females become ornamented if ornamentation helps win these, these battles for territories. Um, so what I've been thinking about recently is, is how the males are, are maybe affecting this. So we've been kind of tunneling in, unlike people in the past, instead of tunneling into males, we've really been tunneling into females. But it's also not good to you know, ignore the, the other sex here because males could be affecting the way the females are behaving as well. And so one thing I've been thinking about is that when I work at this study site with the unornamented females. Again, the males are just constantly flying around with these flower petals. They're spending a lot of time off their territories, just trying to entice females outside of their pair bond, so not their social mate, to, to mate with them. So they're spending a lot of time away from their social mate. And what that likely means, because it, this is what it means in a lot of other study species, is that the males are contributing less to caring for their young. And that would, that would leave females to do most of the, 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 the care of young themselves. And so then they can't really invest so much in their own condition. You know, it's hard for them to, to really maintain some of this ornamentation if it requires elevating testosterone, which can be really costly. Whereas over here, where there's ornamented females, um, again, the, the males and females are just on their territories almost all the time. The males rarely leave. And so they're probably contributing a lot more to paternal care. There's not so much maternal care. Um, I'm actually going to just quickly, I was gonna pause for questions here, but I see 
we're running a little bit low on time. Um, so I'm going to get through this, this last, last section, which is the shortest section. Um, and then if you're able to stick around, um, then we can, we can address questions at the very end. Um, so now sort of diverting from what we just talked about a little bit, I wanted to close just quickly talking about um, some other reasons that I think birds are really important and, and interesting. So birds are, are economically and, and culturally significant. And, and when I talk about economically significant, I am really talking like economically significant here. So birding is a multi-billion dollar industry. And, and the reason I'm highlighting this is, is I've been thinking a lot about how I can continue to do the kind of research I do while providing you know, benefits to, to local people in underdeveloped nations like New Guinea. And one way to do this is to take advantage of the fact that people love traveling to places like New Guinea to see the really amazing birds on display there. Um, and there's just billions of dollars that are being spent on traveling to see birds. And that's only increasing every year. Another thing I wanted to highlight in case some of you are birders already or are interested in getting into birding is that citizen science can be really valuable. And there's a, an app that was developed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology called eBird that allows you to, to upload checklists of the birds that you see while you're out in nature or, or wherever you are. Um, and this is being used to really help better understand species um, ranges and, and movements. And this, this, the, the, the growth of this community is, is just is, is exponential. Um, so over the years, you know, more and more people are using eBird and this is generating a massive data set that now graduate students like me um, can, can use to, to learn about birds and get degrees without having to spend so much money on field research. As you can imagine, it's hard to get the money you need to, to go travel all the way to New Guinea and do this really intensive research in a foreign country. Um, so it's good to have these, these data sets that are being generated by citizen scientists that gives people you know, something fulfilling to do with their free time, but then allows you know, us to learn a lot about the, the species that people are observing out in nature. And birding can be used to fuel conservation because it, again, generates so much money. So this is something that I think about a lot when I think about the things I want to do long term in New Guinea. Um, it is how to sort of leverage the interest in, in birds to, to fuel conservation efforts, but also give people in these underdeveloped countries economic opportunities that they wouldn't have otherwise. And then that, you know, in turn incentivizes conservation. And finally, to close, I wanted to just talk about the cultural significance of birds. These are photos I took at a, a cultural festival that, again, I didn't even know was happening. This is another unexpected um, thing that just suddenly happened in New Guinea. Um, so you can see that the feathers are used in these really elaborate headdresses. And I wanted to show you a, an example of a, of a dance here. I understand it might be a little bit choppy through Zoom, but it's a, a very short video. So hopefully it's not too choppy. And there is some audio here. What I hope you notice is how these red feathers are bouncing up and down. Um, and this is, you know, pretty reminiscent to me of the actual bird that these feathers come from, which I think is interesting. There's some parallel use of these feathers. Um, so here is the real deal, the Rajiana bird of paradise, which is on the Papua New Guinea flag. And here's its dance with the same feathers. So you can see kind of using the, those same really poofy red feathers to just draw a lot of attention. I think there's probably a female that's just out of frame here that he's displaying to. I've been lucky to see these birds display a lot. They're quite common in New Guinea, fortunately. Um, so this is the bird of paradise species that's often around our field sites. Okay, then of course, you know, wild birds can be really important protein resources. And I wanted to just highlight cassowaries here because they're an amazing species. Um, is the only bird species to my knowledge that has uh, killed humans. Um, they can be quite dangerous. There was a zookeeper, or actually someone who had a, um, it wasn't a zookeeper, someone who privately owned a cassowary in Florida in 2019, I think, um, who, whose cassowary um, killed him. Um, so they can be really you know, dangerous birds. They do a really good job of protecting themselves and defending themselves. Um, and people will bring them into captivity in New Guinea. Um, you have to be careful, obviously, because they can be dangerous. Uh, but they bring them into captivity to raise them for a source of protein, particularly for, for major feasts like um, weddings and funerals. 
Um, I was treated to, to cassowary upon my departure in 2019. We had a big going away feast um, of like 40 to 50 people. So cassowaries are, you know, a way to really distribute meat to a lot of people because it's such a massive bird. These birds grow to be over six feet tall. Um, so really amazing birds. This is a, you know, something that conservationists will need to work on. It's something that I would love to work on more in the future. Um, is how to responsibly hunt these birds going forward. They're currently common in New Guinea, but as the population expands, I expect this to change. Um, but they are a big part of the, the culture there. And then finally, to close here, um, one thing I find really cool that I learned in New Guinea is that birds can be used as calendars and clocks there because often these are really remote areas. People don't have um, phones or, or calendars or watches. And so birds like this channel-billed cuckoo, which are these really big birds that migrate up to New Guinea, um, can be used to uh, chart the changing of seasons. So when you see the channel-billed cuckoos arrive, and this is what they sound like. So when you see them or hear them arrive, because they're really loud. So you can imagine a flock of these, they flock up to like 30 or 40, um, can be really loud, they're really noticeable. And so people have traditionally used those as a sign that it's time to, to plant yams, that this is when the, the soil is, is fertile, the rain is about to come. Um, so this is the time to plant yams when you see this bird. On a smaller time scale, this blue winged kookaburra is the first to call in the morning, so it can be used as an alarm clock. So my friend Doka would use this in the field as his alarm clock. Um, so he knew when to meet us because he lived in another house. Um, we'd meet him along this trail in the dark at pre-dawn. And so he would use this bird, which called well before dawn, to, to um, wake up. So this is what it sounds like. Also very loud. This is a very good way to wake up because they are quite a, a loud and, and often obnoxious bird that they are very pretty. It's nice to have them around. Um, and with that, oh, now we're playing all the sounds. With that, um, I will take any questions for those of you um, who are able to stick around. I know there's only a minute left in the actual allotted time, um, but I can stick around for, for as long as we need. Jordan, I have one that came in right as you were starting this next section. Um, is the vertical position of the tail for balancing or another function? Yeah, I think it's for, yeah, I think it's probably for balancing as they're hopping around uh, the grass and, and foraging for, for insects. And actually the, the shorter the tail, the, the females actually prefer shorter tailed males. Um, mm -hmm. So what's thought about that is that the longer the tail, the better for balance probably. Um, and so by having a shorter tail, you're signaling to females that I'm able to, to survive with this really short tail that's you know not very useful. That's, it's a little bit speculative. The, the, there's some um, published research on that. Interesting, okay. Uh, and then this question um, from Marshall, he says, a bit off topic, but do the hormones also affect the production of species specific, ooh, this is a big word, pheromones, pheromones? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I, I don't know much about how hormones affect pheromones, but they certainly could. I, I think people assume that they do. I'm not sure if that's been directly tested. It probably has, and I'm just not familiar with it. Um, but pheromones are especially a new field in um, in birds. We assumed for you know a long time that birds don't have a sense of smell outside of like vultures, um, but we know now that that birds do use pheromones to communicate. It's still being established exactly how they do that and when they do that. But yeah, perhaps. Perhaps having high testosterone could be signaling something in, in the pheromones for sure. Interesting. Okay, another question. Um, can the female birds that are treated with testosterone able to reproduce? And how do the males know they are females if they're colored like males? Yeah, that th those are questions that I've uh, I've thought a lot about. Um, yeah, so with with the breeding certainly a really high dose of testosterone can, can interfere with breeding. And when we gave females testosterone, for the most part, they weren't breeding. There were some that did after having testosterone. And it did seem, we didn't have enough females to test this statistically. It did seem like the females who were given testosterone laid fewer eggs. So normally they lay three. 
I can think of at least one example, and I think maybe two, where they only laid one egg after being given testosterone. So it probably is interfering a little bit with egg production. With the male-female um, recognition, um, we know from studies in those redback fairy wrens um, that they can actually tell apart males and females regardless of color. We don't really know how, but that actually gets back to the pheromone question. It, pro it could be pheromonal that they're, they're sensing some, some chemical, there's some chemical cue there that we're not able to see. Sure. Okay, uh, Joan's question is, how many eggs do the fairy wren lay and what are their nests like? Yeah, so I kind of just touched on the, the eggs. So it's usually, I don't, I can't speak to every fairy wren species. So there's 45 or something like that. There's around 40 species of, of fairy wren. Um, the birds that I'm familiar with lay typically three to five eggs, um, average of about three to four. Um, and the nests are, are, are dome nests because they're often inhabiting areas that get some pretty heavy rain. So they have a, a roof to their nest in the grass. So it's tucked into the grass um, has a little cup for them to lay their, their eggs in and then has a roof over top of that to keep the, the rain out. Okay. Um, let's see, how large is the area that the unornamented subspecies cover? Oh, yeah. Um, I don't, I, I certainly don't know exactly how large it is. They, there are, we know that there are several populations around the island of New Guinea, they're a little bit more limited than those ornamented females. So it seems like there are more populations of the, the ornamented females. Um, the unornamented females are mostly restricted to the area that I showed you on the map where we've been working with them. So kind of all around the border of um, the Indonesian part of the island and Papua New Guinea. Amazing. All right, um, the last question I think from Bill is whether or not your past research has been supported mostly by grants. Yeah, it's mostly been supported by National Science Foundation grants to the uh, professors I've worked for. Um, yeah, so I, I've been lucky to, you know, work on some relatively well-funded, at least for biological studies, um, research. And, and a big part of, you know, our use of those funds in New Guinea is to distribute those funds as much as we can to, to local communities as we, we train and employ people there. Fantastic. And then I just have a couple comments thanking you for an outstanding presentation, which I have to agree. This has just been absolutely amazing. Thank you. And uh, you're going to be a fantastic professor when you're done with your research. Oh, thank you. Um, I think I've hit all of the questions and comments, Gordon, in the chat. So if anybody else still has a couple of minutes and wants to unmute themselves to ask a question or make a comment, you can feel free to do that now. Well, thank you all for working. Um, I appreciate the the enthusiasm for this. There are a lot of a lot of questions which I like. I'm used to dealing with you know undergraduate students for the courses I TA, and there's not as much interaction as this. So this is this is fun for me. Yeah. Has been thank you, fun. Jordan. Wonderful. Okay. Looks great. I think that's all I have. So let's give uh, Jordan a. Virtual round of applause, everyone. That was so fantastic. And really fun well, to listen to on a beautiful sunny afternoon too, so. Off subject, one of my favorite authors is Jared Diamond. He spent a lot of time looking at birds in, in New Guinea. Do you ever run into him? Have you ever? Yeah, yeah, it's funny It's funny you ask now, because I, yeah, he he's done so much work in New Guinea and I actually emailed him after this expedition we did because um, we found some species that were not new species, but unexpected for this area. that are pretty poorly understood. So we were recommended to email him and I was terrified to email Jared Diamond, you know, cause he's <laughs> such a, a big name. Um, and he surprisingly to me, after a, a couple of weeks, he, he responded. So we had a, a little bit of dialogue about um, this project I was working on. Um, I've not met him in person, I, I would love to, but yeah, he's a, he's a legend of, of New Guinea ornithology for sure. Great. Great.